when did, it, did you start to see change? We know that change is incremental, but of late you're seeing more and more. What happened? Do you, can you think about a time when you looked around and went, this is changing now? I have been watching that since the very beginning. Gordon Tutusis and I. Um, I would be on set and we'd just be watching, see how many brown faces there are in, in this production. And, and very often we'd have lots of, of company when extras um, are involved. And um, we start watching crew members. And, and then different things like North of 60 happening. And there was Jordan was learning to, to write for television. And, and uh, I, I just, I'm really kind of getting excited about sitting down and writing my book about all the different things that happened along the way. Because what occurs to me is that when I first ran across the opportunity to act, I thought, man, no time at all. We're going to be doing comedies. We're going to be telling the truth and all of this. And it's taken so long to be able to do that because the majority of society don't even really realize the chasm between us because, you know, life is life. And what's wrong with those guys? You know, and, and so the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and their recommendations was a great relief to me because now we can use the term genocide and not go poo poo. You can't use that. You know, that's for the Jews in Germany and no, you're overdoing it. You know, that's what I was always get when I would talk about genocide um, because we can feel it in our families and in our communities and in our societies and, and where's the understanding of what really happened that was being hidden by the society does not want to admit that this is stolen land that we're living on and living high life a lot of times, a lot of places. So the, the condemnation has got to stop and, um, and really recognize that what we have survived is just incredible. What our civilization has survived is, is really deserves recognition and honor. And, and I'm not ashamed to accept this honor because I accept it in, in the honor of those who have come before me, you know, and, uh, and the ones who are coming, who have been fed by our ancestors. Our ancestors have never left us. And I'm mixed, see? So there's ancestors from all nations that, that, uh, that are a part of my path. And that's important to you. And that's what? That's important to you. Absolutely. You know, I couldn't, couldn't done any of it without that relationship. Because um, I didn't trust nobody. I wouldn't go to their institutions. I wouldn't go to their schools. You know, I could just stand them for a little while. <laughs> it's bad. <laughs> It's but that's so far. just the way I felt. Uh, it's just so difficult because there is such a paternalistic attitude that if you just smarten up and just go right, go white, and do this, this way, your life will be much easier. And that would just make me crazier, you know, and just send me out further in the left field. But, um, so it's been a, a long, long journey of, of uh, survival and, and in that, in that took off. I just went off the rails and uh, how do, how do you mean went off had the rails? a walk about. Just quit, just quit everybody and everything and, and went to, I don't know, maybe Skid Row or uh, maybe was, places where nobody is going to bother me and judge me. Or, you know. Was it connected to the career? Was it connected to work in any way? Or was it separate from that? I always felt that my career was never disconnected from my life. That um, that was the reason that I was here, is to be able to, to see what we can do about getting the truth back into the center of the, the circle somehow. And, um, and I just, 
felt like with every opportunity that came my way, I had another opportunity to, to see what's in it that I might be able to add or contribute to closer to the truth. Um, and, you know, and when you're young, it seems more possible than it actually is, you know. And so I would be so greatly disappointed that it wasn't happening as fast as I would like it. And so I adapted, you know, the concept, well, you know, you got to eat your bannock just one piece at a time. And just, you know, build on it that way. And it, I guess it's good being raised by old people because they got this patience that comes from knowing how slow things can move and, and to jump when the time is there, you know. So I, to answer in a big, long, long way, um, there's not one specific uh, place that we say, yes, there's lots of places. One, I always remember one. Uh, I don't even remember what the show was, but even to bring tobacco into a scene was, really, do you really need to do that? You know, there was that time. Right. Do you really need to do that? That's not what the story is about. You know, it was like it was an intrusion. And um, so we were going to do another shoot, and I thought, oh, man, tobacco's supposed to be in the scene. You know? <sighs> and the director was taking, uh, again, it was Gordon and I. He was taking us around the set and everything. And he said, and here's the tobacco. And it was even wrapped the old Hudson's Bay way. And I was just like, wow. <laughs> wow. It's, it's a small thing, but it's just huge. You know, to accept our way, accept our culture, accept some of that truth is just, just cheers me up. <laughs> So when you voted, when, when you started as an actor, were you thinking these things? That you is this the kind of career you wanted to have? You know what? I was just thinking, what can I do? And, and I was just volunteering all over here and there. And then this acting thing came along and felt good. And then when when that happened, and I was a part of storytelling and. And the first professional job that I had, I was wearing a dress that was 150 years old. And, and it just felt so loving. I just felt so uh, embraced that I thought, this is where I have to be. This is where I can make a difference, you know? I can act, I can, I can figure it out. And um, I just watched as much as I could, listened as much as I could. That was my institution when I was out, is listen. And, and, I, and I told this story before that the first word that you hear as a, as a Cree baby or a Métis baby or around my community is ma. Listen. That's what ma means. And two babies to listen. What's going on outside? What's going on in the next room? It was just a part of the way, eh? right? And so that's what my school books was. It's, ah, listen, watch, learn. Right. Learn what everybody's doing, why they're doing it, and all this kind of stuff. And, and uh, try to learn, because, because of genocide, um, there is much lost in our culture, and lots of understanding. And, and then what was on there, you had to kind of try to scrape it away and find out what the, the, the root, what the truth of it really is, you know? So there's a lot of deciphering. And so I was picking people's brains a lot about different historical times um, and cultural things. And we helped each other a lot in those days. So, you know, the 60s and 70s were really uh, a vibrant time. People were coming in from all over the north, and people were sharing stories and sharing ambitions and, and ideas of how change is supposed to happen. Right. And did you, do you see today some of that, of what was talked about then? Yeah. 
You know, I was thinking, I was looking at this slogan, it takes a village. And in our case, it takes a civilization. Because so much is ripped away from us. Everything outlawed. Yeah. You know, our language, our clothes, and our couldn't hairdos, even, couldn't and everything. Make, couldn't even make the art, as you know. We weren't even allowed to make art. That's right. That we couldn't have lawyers. You know, our, <laughs> everything was outlawed. Our language, our, our, our relationship with creation, absolutely outlawed. People did time in jail for that. And um, so, you know, to get all that back, we have to listen to everybody's nation to, to look over what have they salvaged. Because essentially, we all come from that same place, whatever culture, whether it's from Italy or Greece or, or anywhere in North America, we all come from that same kind of essence. Um, and, and what we've been able to dig from the rubble and in, our, in our nations um, contributes to the plot. Because, you know, I've, I've worked in a lot of different languages, and, and each time you learn something about those nations, Cherokee and Apache and, and uh, I don't know, lots of them, a lot of different languages. And um, I do it because that's one of the things that was taken away from us and outlawed. And because my granny couldn't speak English very well is how I was able to learn my language to hear it, but I was not allowed to speak it because she was afraid for me because of what happened to them when they spoke their language. But ironically, when I went to the city to go to high school, that's when I started learning more Cree, learning more of our language. How often, or did you ever want to just get roles where you're person with a job, character, as opposed to everything is a statement, or is, is, do you ever just want that? Absolutely, absolutely, that's always been the want. But it's, it's such a, a huge distance to go. Uh, for example, when I went to LA, uh, trying to talk to this agency that did finally take me on, and it was because of Dances with Wolves, because mm -hmm. I sent out all kinds of letters and pictures and everything to all these agencies, and I felt like, did that happen? <laughs> Didn't get one phone call or anything. It was sort of a surreal feeling, like, was I sleepwalking? Did I dream that or what? Yeah. Not one response. But as soon as I got hired on Dances with Wolves, oh, no, 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 that's fine. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's, so one agency figured it out. Did so, so, you said one agent, Cole? Um, oh, I wonder what I was going to talk about <laughs> there. I just you said, when you went to LA. So you went to LA. Yes. And we, we were talking about. You said that it's a big leap to get from where where we are to just being able to play a person where it isn't. You know, your where your background isn't the story just to play a character. Yeah, um, yeah, that gap. Um, trying to get an agent to understand that, they call it cross-casting. I said, you know, try to think of me as a human being. And that within our nations, we have doctors and lawyers. I actually met an astronaut. He's a Kiowa, and he's been up there. And, uh, but it, it couldn't sink in. It's so um, sure in that society that we were wiped out, that we were a dead culture and a dead society. It, it was absolute certainty. And so the idea that we were actually in everyday life was beyond anything that they wanted to put in their stories. Their stories were not about that. And if there's an Indian there, you've got to explain what's the Indian doing there. You know, and, and that's the truth. So it gets a little laborious. It was getting a little laborious. And, and now 
a lot of that has cleared up. At least now, um, when I look at something and I don't want to have anything to do with it, I've got a great agent. He understands that. He's not saying, well, you know what, so-and-so is, is really hot and, you know, it's... He understands why I do what I do. So that's been a... Oh, gosh. Well, it's been a responsibility to be that Indian. And that's the only reason that I have a career. It's because of that. Right. It's because I wanted to make change. Here was a possibility... And then it became a responsibility. And then I played Gertrude in Hamlet. And, uh, and there, that culture is completely reversed from ours. In that, in, in my culture, if a man did not look after his brother's widow, that was sinful. He was a jerk. But in there, it was sinful that he was looking after his brother's wife. Or, right. Yeah, he killed his brother and all that kind I mean, of that's, stuff. That's, that's, that's not an insignificant part of the story. <laughs> <laughs> but I couldn't buy that it was a sin right. that in society and everybody in town saw that as a sin. Right. It wasn't the murder that was the sin. <laughs> you know? So those were little discrepancies. And anyway, and, uh, and I felt a commonality with Gertrude because she was the same as so many other women that I had to play. Right. Nothing to say. You know, just do your little thing, whatever the woman was supposed to come and do, and then the guys will carry the story. Don't worry about it, you know? And uh, so there was times on stage where I felt like an emoticon <laughs> with Gertrude. <laughs> But, but it felt really uh, solid and connected to our sisters. And because and I like to, uh, I do work in, with spiritual connection. It was fascinating to be in that world where Gertrude uh, was a grandmother along with all the other grandmothers that I'm all familiar with. That, that come in and out in my world, and there's Gertrude. And, uh, so I have a great-great-grandmother who is Ukrainian, you know. Very nice. I'm half Ukrainian, so that's, that's and I was raised by a Ukrainian woman, so <laughs> I'm happy to hear that. Would the, but that was a change for you when you played that? It, it really made me work, because I didn't have my go-to. Yeah. Oh, right, you just could, yes. yeah. Yeah, right. I just had to, I had to go wild and free there. And uh, it was exciting, you know. And then it was a recognition that there are certain ticks that you um, you gather as you go along. You know, there's certain defenses because of that idea that um, uh, that someone could say to me, "Well, you know, when we're we're working on a scene, it's like, well, you know, we're creating something with infinitesimal something or other, you know." So. Your simplicity is really not needed here. That attitude. And uh, I worked on a project once that I will not name. Come on. Um, we are live streaming, but come on. <laughs> if they did you wrong, no. fuck them. Let's say it. <laughs> you know? <laughs> no? Okay. Right. Some of them are in spirit, bro. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it was that attitude that, and it was supposed to be a collective. I was supposed to have as much freedom as anybody else to put in there. And there was an attitude developed as they were. So therefore, my input had to be put aside. And however, the kernel of the piece was drawn out of an improv that I did, me and my grandmothers. That's where... The, the, the show came from. Did they recognize that? They, no, no, no. Was not recognized. But I have to let that go in some way, right? And what happened is I discovered 10 years later that that experience had blocked my creative process. So we have to watch that as actors and as any, you know, creative flow that 
that genocide, racism, sexism, all these things, and just plain human mess uh, isn't creating these glitches and, in our system. And uh, this last project that I was working on, um, it, I, I felt like it was a clean slate. I felt there was no uh, particular culture that, that was being called on to represent. So in, in this one? Yes, in yeah, this, yeah. the last one that, yeah. that I was doing. And so it just felt really free. And, and I'm at a place now where I feel like, well, now I can really do some good work because I'm recognizing so much. I had to get rid of my anger at one point. How hard was that for you? Yeah, it was, uh, it was rough because that was, that was my go-to. You know, Anger is a real solid energy. It's a gift sometimes. Yeah, and, but it doesn't round out your, your characters. You know, it doesn't give your characters all that expansive humanity. That's... How did you get rid of it? I mean, you didn't get rid of it. You must still have some of it. Oh, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I keep a little cash handy. <laughs> Hey, you earned it. You earned it. You ought to. Um, <laughs> yeah, as long as it doesn't step on me. But it changed your. It changed the way you work. It made you a better actor. Sorry. It made you a better actor. Oh yes, but uh, I had, you know, I had to gather the courage to let it go. Oh. And uh, how did I do that? I I did a, lots of different things exploring this, this inside world and forgiveness and all of that good stuff that I could not stand at that time, right? And uh, so bit by bit, I was able to do it. In part, you think? And working with good people, too. That makes a huge difference. Yeah, yeah. It's in part because you had to be on the front lines for so long that you, you eventually have to take on the mannerisms and the strength and the resiliency of somebody who fights on the front lines. And it's soldier mentality in a way. Yes. And so to, to suddenly yes. sit back and go, why do I feel these things? Well, it's because I've been doing this for so long. And you were, in a way, it's a fatigue. It's a battle fatigue you would have been feeling. Yeah. And it was really discouraging then when, you know, some of our, our own did grow up, I started getting attacked by, you know, uh, I'll say it, by women who felt like they should be where I am. When you, when you say our own. Our own, yeah. Other indigenous own. actors. You know, you find it anywhere and everywhere. Yeah. You know, we call it lateral violence and um, all kinds of things. But it's just a human thing, right? So, you know, always having to grapple with that and try to deal with that. And it, it would it'd take me in because I'd get so infuriated, you know, getting accused of crazy stuff that's not my being. How do I get where I am by being small, by being small-minded and by being, you know, uh, <laughs> protective of my little thing, you know. You can't survive that. You can't advance that way. And um, so, so there was dealing with that as well, you know, to, to say, well, and coming to an understanding after the rage and just <clears throat> um, to, to recognize that that's a part of feeling poor. That's a part of not enough work out there. Right. And not enough stages, not enough uh, possibilities, you know. Um, there should be lots of room for everybody to succeed. There should be. You know, I think the arts is at the core of who we are. Stories and music and dance is fundamental. That's the first thing our kids are doing. And then we expect them to give it up when they become teenagers or, you know, I mean, arts should just really be an essential part of any society. As I understand it, the number is something like two-thirds of the population that is the primary source of income. And I don't think you'll find a culture in the world where that's the case, where it's so, such a big connection to art as the way to survive and the way to, to... As what? As the way to survive and the way to express themselves. 
It's a, it's a huge part of this. So what kind of scripts are you getting now that you like and don't like? And what characters do you not want people to send you scripts to play? I don't want undeveloped characters. I don't want to just come in for a few scenes and, okay, be that, do that. And I've had a number of, of characters where I was expected to be sloppy and dirty and, and kind of snotty. And, but there was nothing in the script to explain, describe, or um, allow. It's just from an old idea of, what you, uh, uh, yeah. of how we're supposed to be or some kind of colonial idea. And so I, my system just won't won't. And, uh, and it, if it was really developed, that'd be totally different. Um, and any stories that um, undo, undo fallacies are great. Um, the, it's, it's not so much the characters, the overall story. If, if the overall story is no good, characters no good. Well, I don't know. I just, you know, what did you feeling have? pretty good right now because I've been working steady for, yeah. you know, a few months. I might get a little more humble in a couple of months. <laughs>